Item number, SCP-250. Object class, Euclid. Special containment procedures. SCP-250 is to be kept in a 50 meter by 50 meter enclosure, simulating a prairie environment, with padded steel walls 15 meters high and one meter thick. The temperature must remain between 20 and 28 degrees Celsius by day and between 10 and 14 degrees Celsius by night, with an average humidity of no more than 8%. This serves the dual purpose of ensuring that SCP-250's overall behavior remains predictable and of maintaining the physical integrity of its component parts. Vegetation within the enclosure is to be maintained on a weekly basis. Although SCP-250 does not physically require nutrition, it is to be fed one live adult pig every two days in order to regulate its aggression and hunting instincts. The remnants of its meal are to be removed from its enclosure no less than one hour after the onset of its nightly dormancy period. This includes cleaning any residual biological debris from SCP-250's physical components with compressed air and whisk brooms. At no point during cleaning are any of SCP-250's physical components to be moved by more than one meter in any direction, as this risks disrupting its dormancy. Dormancy ends within five minutes of sunrise. Access to SCP-250's containment during its activity period is prohibited. Description SCP-250 is the animate fossil skeleton of an allosaur, originally identified as Allosaurus fragilis. However, an incomplete scientific article found in the personal effects of paleontologist Dr. indicates that this classification may have been erroneous. It consists of 153 disarticulated bones and 14 plaster and fiberglass replacements held together and animated by an unknown force. Study of this force is hindered by SCP-250's aggressive behavior, which has been assessed by Foundation paleozoologists as being well within theoretical norms for an Allosaurus. SCP-250 emulates what are presumed to have been the standard daily activities of a living Allosaurus. It wanders its enclosure by day, enters a state of dormancy by night, and will attempt to kill and devour anything which it perceives as suitable prey, including humans. Its lack of organs does not seem to affect its behavior in any way, except in that the remains of any prey it consumes will inevitably fall out of the gaps in its skull, neck, and ribcage at which point it ignores them. SCP-250 was first excavated as an 80% complete skeleton in 19 Records from the excavation do not include any report of anomalies. Several years later, it was transferred to an undisclosed museum of natural history in where it was assembled, mounted, and put on display. On the night of SCP-250 seized and killed an intruder to the museum. Although damage to the intruder's remains was so extensive as to render forensic identification impractical, they were conclusively shown to not be those of paleontologist Dr. whose office in the museum was extensively vandalized that night and who has not been seen since. Foundation personnel embedded within museum staff reported the incident, and SCP-250 was taken into custody. Item number. SCP-291 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-291 must remain disconnected from any power source when not in use for testing. A team of two personnel should remain on guard outside SCP-291's containment room and will be swapped out weekly. While disconnected from a power supply, SCP-291 may be considered safe. SCP-291's main entryway closes and locks upon disconnection from a power supply, but the door may be opened manually from the interior, in the event of any personnel being trapped. All blocks of disassembled organism are to be kept stored in a designated storage locker within the containment room, and are to be properly labeled with a Sharpie marker. Personnel responsible for lost or damaged blocks will be moved to other projects. Description SCP-291 was located in Data Expunged. SCP-291 resembles a small building in structure, a nearly featureless steel box, 
measuring 10.5 meters by 30.2 meters at the base and 15 meters tall. On one of the narrow sides, there is a large door, 5 meters wide, that opens upwards, similar to a garage door, composed of metal slats a few inches high each. There is no handle on the exterior of the door, and while closed, all attempts to open it using non-destructive methods have failed. The interior of the door features a lock that can be opened manually to lift the door for a few seconds, before an unknown mechanism will force it shut again. At the other end of SCP-291 is a similar opening with a lock and handle on the exterior and interior, allowing the door to be opened from either side. Two small, similar hatches, only one meter by one meter, can be found to the left of both doors, and may be opened from the exterior. The materials that compose SCP-291 do appear to only be as strong as any other example would suggest, and a force that would normally bend or cut through steel will do the same to SCP-291. Such testing is currently not allowed, due to the risk of damaging SCP-291. The interior of SCP-291 is not well explored, due to the extremely tight confines of the machinery and strong pulses of electromagnetic energy throughout various points while activated. When connected to a suitable power source, SCP-291 activates with mechanical clanks and buzzing, and the entryway door springs open. The room inside is 4 meters by 2 meters, with a rather simple console board, a large display screen, and what has been described as a plexiglass coffin to one side. Suitable in size for most humans under 2.13 meters, or 7 feet, in height, who are not morbidly obese. The coffin rests on a conveyor belt a meter in height, the coffin itself being approximately a meter deep with a blue-green gel cushion of unidentified material lining the bottom. It has been described as pleasantly form-fitting and very cool and soft. Several tubes emerge from the side of the room over the coffin. Opposite the coffin, a number of cubby holes of various sizes, with small doors that may be opened or closed, are present on the wall. Their purpose shall be elaborated upon later. When a living animal, human or otherwise, is laid in the coffin, dead organisms, organisms with a mass of less than 1.6 kilograms, and groups of multiple organisms triggered no reaction, no matter their position, the control room moves into the ready state. In this state, the display screen shows a scanned, grid-lined image of the organism in the coffin, and the buttons on the console board become operable. Some of the smaller buttons will trigger different effects in the displayed image, such as toggling the skin and muscles of the display on and off, and revealing certain organs and organ systems, whether in real time or frozen, depending upon more settings. There are no words, numbers, or symbols on the display or any of the buttons, and all buttons have two settings. On, in which they glow, and off, in which they are unlit. Various combinations produce different effects, and Dr. Wrights has been kind enough to spend enough time playing with it to work up a crude user's manual. Three large buttons, visibly different from the controls for the display, are available to the side. Provided that a living organism is lying in the coffin, the first button may be pressed. Pressing any buttons under any other circumstances yields no effect and the button remains off, no matter how many times pressed, and the tubes extending over the coffin dispense a blue liquid into the coffin. This unidentified liquid acts as a sedative upon skin contact, and the occupant of the coffin quickly falls unconscious. The liquid can apparently be inhaled and swallowed without any harm. D-Class personnel have reported the taste to be similar to Kool-Aid. Samples have yielded little results in identification. Once the coffin is filled to the brim, the liquid quickly congeals into a thick syrup, and then to a solid gel. Over this period, the occupant's detectable bodily functions, such as breathing and heartbeat, cease. This may be observed on the display screen. Once the liquid fully solidifies, the display screen shuts off, and the conveyor belt starts to move. All attempts to stop the conveyor belt and remove either the coffin or the occupant causes the entire process to shut down, after which the blue liquid evaporates within a few minutes and the subject regains consciousness, unharmed. The conveyor belt carries the coffin and occupant through a small door that quickly locks closed, and the entire machine becomes a cacophony of mechanical clanking 
whirring, and grinding. The display screen will only display a rectangle that slowly fills, like a loading bar, as SCP-291 does its work. Depending upon the size of the organism, SCP-291 finishes its as-of-yet unknown process in approximately 20 to 30 minutes, at which point, the product can be retrieved at the opposite end of SCP-291. The back door of SCP-291 leads to a similar chamber, also containing a conveyor belt similar to the one that holds the coffin in the entryway. There is also a series of two dozen cubby holes or lockers, identical to those found in the entry room. These cubby holes may be pulled out to retrieve their contents, parts of the organism, disassembled and preserved in blocks of an unidentified clear solid. These blocks are quite strong, but they can be melted by extremely high temperatures or shattered by sharp blows from a pick. However, breaking the blocks ruins the preservation method of SCP-291 and results in the preserved object being unusable. The rest of the block quickly begins to dissolve into dust after a few minutes. Whole blocks, however, may be stored indefinitely until being reinserted into SCP-291 via the cubby holes in the entrance room. Each block has a distinct size and will only fit snugly in its designated hole. Placing blocks in the wrong holes gets no reaction from the machine and will prevent it from being reactivated until the problem is fixed. Cubbies may be left empty, however, and it will function as normal. It is ill-advised to leave a cubby containing a vital organ empty. When the blocks are placed correctly and the doors to them shut, the second button on the console may be pressed. This does not work if the display shows a loading bar, as another operation is taking place. The doors to the cubby holes lock after a few seconds, during which SCP-291 removes them through some means, and the machinery of the device grows louder, accompanied by another loading bar on the display screen. Reassembly takes slightly longer, approximately 40 to 50 minutes to finish, after which a plexiglass container, similar to the initial coffin, emerges from a door on the conveyor belt in the exit room, holding a fully assembled organism immersed in blue liquid that slowly evaporates as the organism wakes. Reassembled organisms have no memory of the process, likening the experience to a very restful, dreamless sleep. They awaken with some slight disorientation, but this passes after a few minutes, and they complain about being very hungry. Tests reveal that they are reassembled with their stomachs empty. Organisms are also reassembled nude and devoid of any hair. A block containing what has been identified as the contents of the organism's digestive system, hair, scraps of clothing, and any other objects on the organism is deposited into one of the small side doors outside the main doors and may be considered waste. Surveillance and scanning equipment sent inside the machine is disposed of in the same way, often twisted and wrecked. Later testing revealed that organisms can be reassembled in different, potentially malicious ways. The third button is only to be used should something go wrong, when the production stops and the button blinks. It undoes whatever has been done the best it can, and shuts down the whole process, while triggering some kind of cleaning and reset method. Addendum. Blocks are clear and therefore the organs and body parts contained within may be easily identified and observed. The body is divided up like such. Brain Lungs and diaphragm Heart Digestive system Reproductive organs Left eye Right eye Upper left torso and arm musculature up to the elbow and various organs upper right torso and arm musculature up to the elbow, and various organs, lower left torso and upper leg musculature and various organs, lower right torso and upper leg musculature and various organs, lower left leg and foot, lower right leg and foot, lower left arm and hand, lower right arm and hand, neck and head musculature and various organs, Skeletal system from mid-spine up. Skeletal system from mid-spine down. Lymphatic and circulatory system from waist up. Lymphatic and circulatory system from waist down. Skin neatly folded. 
testing results. Reassembling a body without vital organs results in the production shutting down, requiring the use of the third button. The body will be redeposited in block form at the exit, still inert. Reassembling a body without non-vital organs or body parts will result in that organ or body part being absent when the organism awakens. The wound sealed by unknown means that leave little to no scar tissue. Providing a body part for a missing body part will result in said body part being attached to its new body seemingly without fail. It has proved effective for heart transplants, limb transplants, and exchanging skin from one person to another. Swapping the brains of two people results in a complete transfer of that person's personality and memories, and may be reversed, although subjects are often very disoriented for several days and complain of psychological and physical discomfort, like wearing shoes not quite the right size. Swapping body parts between different species has yielded mixed results. Dr. Wrights has suggested that testing continue, and the request is pending. Only three successful cross-species transfers have occurred out of the 20 tests performed so far. 001. A cat's left eye was swapped out for a human's left eye. The subject could use the eye fully, and mentioned they felt they had adapted to it rather well. Their new left eye displayed all the abilities of a cat's eye, including difficulty seeing colors, and heightened perception in the dark. Although this test was unauthorized, the results were considered to be mildly impressive enough to allow further testing. The cat, given a human eye, clawed its human eye out in a week. 007. A human's brain was successfully transferred into the body of an English Mastiff, reportedly thanks to the dog's large skull size. He requested to be transferred back to his human body as soon as possible, though. The Mastiff, in the human's body, learned to walk upright within a few hours, and was disassembled again after an incident involving the humiliation of a female doctor. 016 a female Class D personnel had her reproductive organs switched with those of a pregnant Labrador Retriever. No tests involving using SCP-291 with other SCPs have yet been authorized. Item Number SCP-308 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-308 is stored in a sterile containment module with restricted access. Personnel entering the room must observe Level 1 Isolation Protocol and will be remotely observed by security personnel for the duration of their visit. No organic material may be placed in SCP-308 without Level 4 authorization. SCP-308 will remain open unless involved in active experimentation. Description: SCP-308 is an ornate funerary casing of Aztec origin, dated roughly 500 years old, with dimensions 1.8 meters by 0.9 meters by 1.2 meters. It was found at the archaeological excavation among similar, though mundane, artifacts in a temple complex. SCP-308 is covered in Nahuatl pictographs, consistent with ceremonial practices of its time, though unusual in the care and expense devoted to them. Under normal conditions, the artifact is inert, but it exerts an animating effect on organisms when they are placed inside it. The effect was first observed in the original inhabitant of the coffin, data expunged. The poor condition of the individual has been attributed to its 500-year incarceration in the casing without nourishment or stimulation. Healthy, injured, or even deceased subjects are transformed by the artifact. Regardless of the condition of an organism prior to placement in the coffin, with one exception, the creature will exhibit certain traits upon removal. Superficially, subjects remain unchanged, retaining injuries and conditions sustained prior to exposure. Despite the nature and seriousness of such trauma, however, subjects appear alive and responsive to the extent the injuries allow. For example, a subject exposed to a fatal dose of cyanide in excess of 100 times the fatal dosage, conversed normally, respired, and displayed vital signs such as heartbeat and brain activity. 
The subject also presented classical symptoms of acute poisoning, including shortness of breath, drowsiness, headache, and cyanotic skin, but did not succumb, even after a period of many days. Another subject was pierced in several major arteries and exsanguinated before exposure to SCP-308. A subsequent examination revealed a heartbeat, but no discernible blood pressure, and the subject was conversant, though conscious of great pain in the injured areas. Subjects in this altered state will neither succumb to any injury, again, one exception, no matter how severe, nor heal any wound, no matter how minor. In addition, they display a dependence on the artifact similar to addiction, insisting on regular exposure and becoming erratic and violent when this is withheld. Subjects experience pain normally, and many who have suffered extensive damage will rapidly deteriorate psychologically. Progressive conditions, such as cancer and infections, continue to advance in subjects exposed to SCP-308, though instead of dying, they suffer from ever-escalating symptoms. The only thing that a subject requires to be affected by SCP-308 is the presence of a heart. Subjects with a wounded or diseased heart are animated, as are portions of organisms or tissues connected to a heart. Individuals with their hearts removed, or body portions without a heart, are unaffected by exposure to the artifact. Even an isolated heart, placed in the container, will resume beating at a normal rhythm. Subjects exposed to SCP-308 remain alive and essentially unkillable until their heart is destroyed, whereupon they succumb and decay normally. Because of the nature of SCP-308 and the apparent psychological effects it exerts on subjects, all exposed individuals must be isolated and terminated at the conclusion of testing. Temporary use of SCP-308 to debrief deceased personnel permitted by Level 4 authorization only. Experimental Log 308A Excerpts Subject Canis Lupus Familiaris Condition Healthy Summary of Results Subject apparently normal Showed typical pain reaction, but survived repeated laceration, evisceration, exsanguination, burns over 90% of body surface, multiple gunshots, electrocution, and lobotomy. Subject terminated by blunt impact trauma destroying the heart. Subject D-43895 Condition Stage 4 Small Lung Cell Carcinoma Summary of Results Subject continued to worsen post-exposure. Regular breathing ceased three days after exposure due to extensive tumor growth, but subject retained consciousness. Tumor infiltrated renal system, leading to external growths approximately 13 centimeters in diameter in the area by 14 days. Secondary tumors occlude vision and infiltrate the brain by 19 days. Upon the final ceasing of biological function at 52 days, metastatic tumors were evident over 70% of the body's surface area and had infiltrated every organ system, including the heart, which was the cause of subject's death. Subject D-34892 Condition Head and heart surgically removed from the rest of the body, keeping attached vasculature intact. Summary of Results Subject revived and apparently conscious, though apparently in too much pain to communicate meaningfully. Applied painkillers had no visible effect. Research ongoing. Subject Agent Condition Terminated in the line of duty. Recovering SCP Summary of Results Animated for debriefing. Subject requested and was granted two weeks to prepare a post-action report before termination. After nine days, subject's nightly request for access to SCP-308 was denied. The following morning, subject escaped containment by murdering a technician and proceeded to SCP-308's containment area, where she was terminated by guards on station with a bullet to the heart. Subject D-34877 Condition Expired from myocardial infarction Summary of Results Subject was recovered from the artifact, inert, 
with massive trauma to the chest, through which the heart had been expelled or ripped. The heart was beating regularly, but the subject's body showed no signs of life. Subject's medical background indicated that he had received a heart transplant three years prior. Item number SCP-321 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-321 is to be kept in a regulation containment chamber. SCP-321 has been outfitted with extensive braces to make up for weaknesses in bone structure and muscle mass. Its artificial heart is to be examined once a month for any damage. SCP-321 is to be fed three times daily. Solid foods are excluded from its prescribed diet. Three staff members are on temporary SCP-321 assignment at this time. SCP-321 is to be given three hours a day of exercise and physical therapy, with the rest of its time not involved in experiments to be confined to its cell. While SCP-321 is incapable of asking for anything, it has been allowed several stuffed toys. Description SCP-321 is a human female, born on July 4th, 18... SCP-321 is currently 3.1 meters tall and weighs approximately 110 kilograms. Subject is devoid of melanin in hair, eyes, and skin. It is incapable of speech, but can still vocalize, and has proven to have problems with spatial recognition and awareness. SCP-321 has displayed a low degree of intellect, and has problems adjusting to new situations. SCP-321 was the stillborn child of junior researcher Adam and his wife, medical assistant Evelyn Junior researcher took it upon himself to make use of several SCPs including SCP-590, in an effort to bring his daughter back to life. The procedure worked, but the result was taken into Foundation custody for examination. The subject was later given an SCP designation. SCP-321 was quickly found to have recuperative abilities, capable of healing injuries inflicted upon it at approximately five times the normal rate. Subject was at this time entered into Foundation records as SCP-321. In the time since, SCP-321's body has continued to age at a decelerated rate, approximately half that of a normal human. Although its aging has been slowed, SCP-321 has continued to grow, showing no signs of stopping, despite now being taller than any recorded human. At this point in time, it is believed SCP-321's recuperative abilities stem from overabundant production of stem cells, a result of its interaction upon death with expunged. For a period of time beginning in early 19... The limits of SCP-321's natural heart were reached, and SCP-321 was too tall for blood to be circulated properly. During this period, SCP-321 was restrained physically in order to keep its heart capable of pumping blood to the brain. Despite this, slow decay was evident, and the limits of SCP-321's recuperative abilities were found, as it was not capable of healing damage that was being dealt constantly. Work began in 1948 to create an artificial heart to prolong SCP-321's existence. The heart was completed in 19... Since then, all damage done to SCP-321 has been healed. SCP-321 has a very low intelligence. Everyday activities are a chore for it, and it can take several months to years to teach it to do such things as use utensils for eating. While SCP-321 has fully developed vocal cords, it seems incapable of learning speech, instead crying and making nonsense noises, as of those typically heard from infants under the age of six months. July 31st, 18... Requesting SCP-321 be removed from SCP status. Junior Researcher Adam. Request denied. 05... January 10th, 18... Requesting SCP-321 be removed from SCP status. Personnel Director Adam. Request denied. 05... May 3rd, 19... We can learn nothing more from SCP-321, 
suggesting we remove its SCP designation. Site Director Adam. Site 4. Request denied. 05. June 31st, 19. SCP-321 is to be decommissioned and returned to her family, effective immediately. 0512. Request denied. This is the final time, Adam. She is not now, nor ever has been, your daughter. If you attempt this again, I will gather the council and you will be removed. 051. Item number. SCP-331. Object Class. Safe. Special Containment Procedures. When not being used, SCP-331 is to be kept within a typical electronic seven-digit metal safe in Dr. R***'s office. The code is to be changed on a monthly basis by said doctor. Personnel who wish to examine SCP-331 must ask for authorization beforehand. As of date undisclosed, SCP-331 is worn by SCP-331-1. Description SCP-331 is a red plastic cat collar, approximately 23 centimeters in length. Metal studs surround the collar in intervals of 1 centimeter. Testing has confirmed the metal to be nickel. The bell consists of stainless steel, electroplated with 24 karat gold. Ringing the bell has no distinguishable effect, adverse or otherwise. The word tumbles has been painted on the back of the collar in yellow paint. Testing has confirmed that there is nothing unusual about the paint. SCP-331 exhibits no abnormal tendencies when worn by a living cat. When SCP-331 is fastened around the neck of a deceased cat, hereafter SCP-331-1, SCP-331-1 is resurrected with no initial adverse effects. The collar does not halt the decomposition process, however. Fur and skin still rot at a regular pace. Organs are unaffected by the decomposition process. Testing has yet to determine the exact cause for this. SCP-331-1 shows no signs of distress during the decomposition process. SCP-331-1 can be killed by conventional methods, whereupon it remains deceased. The separation of SCP-331 and SCP-331-1 data expunged, unless SCP-331-1 is deceased. It should be noted that SCP-331-1 always answers to tumbles and has an amiable personality, despite what it was called or how it behaved pre-mortem. SCP-331 was discovered when reports reached a Foundation agent of a zombie cat witnessed around Park. Said agent immediately alerted the Foundation of a possible outbreak of SCP-8. MTF was dispatched and neutralized SCP-331-1, whereupon it was transported to Site after no trace of SCP-8 was detected. Upon arrival, research was conducted on SCP-331 that confirmed its properties. Item Number SCP-374 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-374 is to be stored in a disassembled state. The blade of SCP-374 is to be stored separately from the rest of the apparatus and must be cleaned and polished with optical grade polishing cloth and non-abrasive cleanser after each use. Due to their extreme age, all parts of the apparatus must be stored in climate-controlled facilities. The blade must be stored in a facility with a Class II fire prevention system, and the frame must be stored in a facility with a Class III fire prevention system. SCP-374's properties are dependent on the conjunction of its original wooden frame and metal blade. These are to be preserved. Other parts of SCP-374, screws, bolts, pull cord, may be replaced as necessary. Each expired instance of SCP-374-1 is to be preserved in formaldehyde for one year, after which it is to be incinerated. Except in emergencies, only D-Class personnel are to be used to produce instances of SCP-374-1. All interrogation sessions are to be recorded, transcribed, and archived. Interrogations are to begin with the question, Can you hear me? in order to compel a response. Description 
SCP-374 is a French Revolution-era guillotine made of oak with a steel blade. SCP-374 manifests no unusual properties when not in use. Any use of SCP-374 to decapitate a live human produces an instance of SCP-3741. SCP-3741 is a severed human head, inhabited by the personality of a French Revolution-era man named Jean-Philippe Horace Donatien. For approximately 35 minutes after instantiating, SCP-3741 is able to see, hear, and speak, and to manifest limited forms of enhanced awareness, enabling it to provide true answers to any questions it is asked. Its strategic usefulness is limited by its argumentativeness and its antipathy towards the Foundation. Since it is convinced that members and employees of the Foundation are evil murderers, it may attempt to obfuscate, mislead, or change the subject. As the end of its period of activity approaches, SCP-3741 first loses its sight, then its hearing, and eventually becomes inert. History SCP-374 was recovered during a raid on a Marshall, Carter, and Dark facility in 19... Upon first instantiating in Foundation custody, SCP-3741 made the following speech. Ah, my new slave masters. Here are the rules of my existence. First, ask me any questions and I provide true answers. Second, expletive. All of you and expletive, all your mothers. You are murderous slave-owning tyrants, and I expletive hate you. Always remember that. Addendum. SCP-3741 has taken to responding to direct questions with true but useless statements, such as, I don't want to tell you that, I hate you, and I hope everyone affiliated with the SCP Foundation burns in hell forever. Its uncooperativeness in these cases can be circumvented by simply telling it, that doesn't matter. Addendum. Due to its tendency to launch into lengthy philosophical digressions about free will, predestination paradoxes, and chaos theory, SCP-3741 is not to be asked questions about the future. Interview Log March 2000 Doctor, can you hear me? SCP-3741 Of course I can hear you, you stupid expletive. What the expletive? Do you foundation expletive want this time? Jean-Philippe, where are my keys? Jean-Philippe, does the stupid expletive in the cafeteria like me? Jean-Philippe, what is 58 times 23? Doctor, how and why is your consciousness bound into this guillotine? How and why are you compelled to provide true and informative answers to the questions we ask you? SCP-3741 I am not allowed to answer questions about that topic. Oh, good work, expletive. You've wasted a human life on one of the few things I can't give you information about. You expletive monster. Lesson complete. To continue with your orientation training, subscribe to SCP Orientation right now and make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming videos.